Isaiah 58. Let's call this one if in this famous passage that talks about true and false fasting and the disappointment that can come from doubling down on what seems to be righteousness, but is really something else. As in verse one, he is going to start off by saying, do not hold back. Declare to my people their transgressions. Sorry, declare to my people their transgressions. As in verse two, he is going to talk about the contradiction. Yet they seek me daily as if they actually cared. What he's actually going to say is as if they were actually interested in doing right, as I call it, but doing righteousness as it literally is going to say in the ESV. It's going to say even more at the end of verse two. They ask righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God saying, why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it as the latter half of verse three is going to help them understand why. As he's going to say, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice heard on high. It's me truncating the actual quote. But verse 5 is going to go on to talk about the way in which uh, the pretense with which they are appearing to fast is not, once again, going to make their voice heard. As verse 6, uh, really verses 6 through 8 are verses much like we saw back in Isaiah 53. The verses I'm just going to flat out read because even if they're not, uh, sorry, even if they are not super famous, if they are super profound to me. Verse 50, sorry, chapter 58, verse 6, reading, is not this the fast that I choose to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh. Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go up before you, or sorry, your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Setting off uh, at least two more if-then statements, talking about the way in which if they will simply uh, basically understand what God is asking for them or from them, things may actually begin to make a lot more sense. Picking up though with a second then in verse nine, where he'll say, then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. If, as we mentioned, you take away the yoke from your midst, second half of verse nine, the pointing of the finger and the speaking of wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then he's going to go on to say, latter half of verse 10 and verse 11, he will guide you continually, satisfy your desire even in the scorched places, and make your bones strong. As he will go on in verse 12 to say, your ruins shall be rebuilt and you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets to dwell in. As the last if beginning in verse 13 is going to say, if you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, essentially twice saying, if you refrain from doing your own pleasure on his holy day, looking for your own way or looking after your own ways. And once again, seeking your own pleasures, talking idly, verse 14, then you shall take delight in the Lord and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth, feeding you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The two literal if-then sections at the end of the chapter, really in connection with the third if-then comparison, reminding me once again, as we started off Isaiah, with the very simple but now consistent observation, we will not be saved on our own terms. And fasting, sacrifice, or even passionate prayer are not going to replace the justice sincerity, and genuine kindness he has called us to give one another.